It's such a sweet spirit in this place. Amen. Amen. We can't help but to feel the presence of the Lord in this place. God, we honor and bless your holy name, Lord. We lift you up. We give you glory. We give you praise, Lord. We ask that you do what you do, Lord. We ask that you have your way in this place. Lord, we pray that you move us out of your way, God. You speak. You teach. You convict. You draw. Lord, you take control. You take control, Lord. We thank you, God. We love you. We praise you. In your mighty son, Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Hallelujah. You're such a blessed Savior. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Yahweh. We love you. We love you. Amen. Amen. Glory. Amen. God is so good. I tell you. For I was explaining earlier, for the last, I say about month, we've been, uh, some of us that have been called to preach and teach and share the word, we've been in the book of James, and what we've been doing is what we call the summer sermons presentation. Okay, so we've took the book of James, and and every person had a little section from there, and on Fridays, we would come together and we would do like 15 minute sermons. And then we get critiqued after each sermon. But I tell you, the Lord met us every week, every week. And, um, and this book has totally convicted my spirit because. James is a bad boy. Let me tell y'all, he bad. He bad. All right. So what this letter is, is he's writing to Christians, Jewish Christians that were scattered because of persecution. They had to leave their land. And so he's, he's giving them instruction and warnings. And then he's giving them wisdom and dropping nuggets and teaching them how to live out their Christian life while under persecution. Amen. Amen. We can relate to that if we have been watching the news and we see what's going on in our country, in our world, in our land. We're living under turmoil and all kinds of things, afraid to have our, to send our children to school, afraid to, to go to Walmart. Amen. And I'm sure our children are feeling this anxiety. And so Paul is, I mean, James is sending this letter, teaching them how to live out their Christian life. And he starts off in chapter one by saying, count it all joy. Count it all joy when you face these persecutions. Count it all joy. Hallelujah. So I have the awesome task and assignment to give you one of his nuggets about the tongue. This little small thing here. Yeah, it's powerful. Let me tell y'all. It is powerful. And so I believe that the book of James, the entire book, the big idea in that book is the part where he tells us that as Christians, people ought to be able to look at us and, and by our works and by our deeds know that we are Christians. James says it like this. If you say you have faith but no works or no deeds, your faith is dead. So how you live, how you talk, how you walk, how you treat others, how you love, how you pray ought to show your faith, ought to display your faith. So we're going to look at the, the tongue this morning. Did I pray already? Did I pray? Lord Jesus. <laughs> I need to go to Africa because they said the youth go to 40. And I said, well, shoot, that makes me a young adult. I need to go to Africa, get my mind back. Woo. 
Okay, we're going to be coming from James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Okay, James chapter 3, talking about the tongue. When, when I was a kid, my brother and my sister and I, my sister's a middle child, and she always got something to say, always. Argumentative, got to have the last word, just yip, yap. All the time. And so she got the most whoopings. And, and sometimes my brother and I probably should have got a whooping, but she would go on so and irritate my mom till she would get a whooping instead of us. Okay? And then she would say, why am I in trouble? And my mom would say, because of your mouth. Because of your mouth. Y'all know anybody like that? I'm glad my husband left because he was pointing at me. You know, always got to have the last word, argument of know everything, always got to say something. But not only that, we, we, we tend to use our mouths to gossip and insult. Y'all know, y'all know. Yeah, and so this morning, what, what I want you to do is look at your neighbor and say, watch your mouth. Now look at your other neighbor and tell them to watch your mouth. Yeah, watch your mouth so you don't get in trouble. <laughs> Let's, I'm going to read all 12 verses, and then we'll go back and talk about them. All right? Is that all right? Okay. Beginning with verse 1. It says, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says... He is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Verse 7. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, Verse 8, but no human being can tame the tongue. Y'all hear that? <laughs> yeah, no human being can tame the tongue. Why? It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh water and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grape or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. So my big idea is this, that as believers, that's you and I. That's if you've given your life to Christ. That's you and I. As believers, we must watch what we say. For we cannot tame our own tongue. Because it's powerful, it's evil, and by its very nature, it's inconsistent. 
And so because of all that, we need divine guidance. So watch your mouth. Yeah, watch your mouth. So again, James, what he's doing, Minister Maya said this to me earlier, is that he's presenting a divine blueprint on how to walk out this Christian life. And he's dropping all these nuggets. And so we're going to look at the tongue because, believe it or not, our words, our conversation can have people looking at us and determining whether we're Christians or not. What is your conversation at work? What is your conversation at home with your children, with your spouse, with your friends, with your coworkers, your family? What is your conversations like? Can they look at you and see your faith? One of the commentators said this, that our words are also works. Our words are also works. So if James is saying, you can see my faith by my works, what are your words saying? What are your words saying? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, for by your words you will be justified and by your words you can be condemned. Why? Because your mouth speaks what's in your heart. I'm going to say that again. Your mouth speaks what's in your heart. <sighs> Man, that convicted me. I have been repenting for about two weeks now. All of y'all know that. <laughs> so, James, we're going to talk a lot about the taming of the tongue. So, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on verses 1 and 2 other than to say that he was um, probably addressing people that wanted to be teachers because it was like a prestigious type thing. Um, People that were called to teach, people that were rabbis, others wanted to be like them. And he was probably addressing them that they had to be careful about that because you have to be careful of what you say. For what you say, you will be held accountable for. I believe that even today, as believers, as we walk and talk in this world, in, in society, in our communities, in our church, we are teachers by our life, by our conversation. And so we'll be held to a higher accountability. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth because we cannot tame our own tongue. Watch your mouth because we cannot tame our own tongue. Verses 3 through 5. James uses this illustration of a horse and a ship because probably his audience at that time could relate. It was like a, their mode of transportation. They would have a horse with chariots or they would get on a ship. And, and so what he's saying is the little bitty bit that they put in the horse's mouth would help to guide that big horse. And the little bitty rudder on the ship, the ship would be pushed along by the strong winds, but then that little rudder would guide the ship and direct the ship. I don't know much about horses, but I know before they put the, when a, when a horse, before he's tamed, <laughs> before he's tamed with the bridle, he's wild and uncontrollable. Amen? But that bridle tames him down and the rider is able to control the direction he goes in right left whoa jump over all the stuff that they do with the horses I ain't into no horses <laughs> and then, then then the ships in those days I said as I said were were pushed along by the wind but the little rudder helps to turn it 
guided so that it doesn't run into the shore or, or get, caught, get caught up in the storm and, and lose its direction or, or worse, be shipwrecked. So these little pieces are powerful and mighty in comparison to the big horse and the big ship. I don't think Paul is saying that our little bitty tongue will control our bodies, but I do think he's saying these little bitty tongues can direct our lives, our destinies, our lifestyles. So we're going to look again at, at, at these illustrations. He tends, in, in my translation, to use this word guide two times. And so what, what you learn from inductive Bible study classes, when you see a word more than once, you probably should look at it, right? And so guide, he says, he says that with the, the bits in the mouths of the horses, we guide their bodies. He says on the ship with the rudder, uh, we are, they are guided by the small rudder. So guiding uh, means steering, uh, directing, right? Moving along, transferring. And, and, and so those little things are helping to move this animal or, or this ship along the way. But what was really interesting to me was when I did the uh, gra grammatic nuance of this word, guide. And so it was written or spoken in, in, in what's called the present passive. And here's what that means. It means if the subject of the sentence is being acted upon, then the verb is referred to as being in the passive voice. Y'all got that? <laughs> okay, let's, let's go back. Let's get this. Let's get this. Okay, so if, let's look at verse 4. If the ship is the subject, right? Guide or direct would be the verb, an action word, right? If the, the, the verb is considered the passive voice, if it is, is something else is acting upon the subject. What does that mean? The ship cannot guide itself. The ship is being guided by an outside source. The passive voice. Amen? And then we said in the present tense. What that means is that it's continuous action. It's action of progress. It's a state of persistence. So consistently, this outside source, this, this uh, James calls him the pilot of the ship, He's directing and guiding the ship consistently. Consistently. Why? Because the moment he lets go, the ship goes its own way. And it could be out of control. Now let's look at our tongue. We cannot tame our own tongue. We cannot tame it because it goes its own way. It's uncontrollable. It needs to be restrained. It needs to be held under control. It needs to be held into check. It needs to be subdued. It needs to be overpowered. That's what tame means. And so if we look at this illustration, then what that means is that an outside source must be able to control our little bitty tongue. And I, I, I say to you that outside source must be a divine source. A divine source must control, lead, guide, turn. Why? Because then I'm going to say anything I want to say. I'm going to be all out of, out of order. Because that's what the tongue does. It cannot be tamed by us. It has to be tamed by an outside source. So that our lives can be directed. So that our destiny can be directed. Jesus said 
in Matthew 12 that our speech reveals what is in our heart. But he also goes on to say in Matthew 15 that what we put in our mouth is not what defiles us. What defiles us is what comes out of our mouths. Amen. And, and it comes out of our mouth because it comes from the heart. And guess what? The, what comes out of the heart is evil. So we need that divine guidance. Watch your mouth. It can't be controlled by us. The, fact, the last couple of weeks, there's been a lot going on, a lot of turmoil in, 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 uh, in our nation. Mass shootings. And so a lot of the Democrats are, are blaming the president, right? And wanting him to tame his tongue. Because they're saying that his, his rhetoric, his speeches are fanning, their, he's fanning the flames of white nationalism, of racism. And because of the, his talk, people are becoming bold and coming out and doing things that are ungodly. But here's what I came to tell you. President Trump cannot tame his own tongue. It needs to be tamed and controlled by an outside source. Better yet, a divine intervention. Divine intervention. Amen. So they can talk all they want about him. But unless he's submitting his life, his heart, his mind, his tongue under God, he's going to continue to come out with that rhetoric because <laughs> he can't help it because he can't control his own tongue. And neither can you and neither can I. Why? Why can't we? Because our tongue is evil. Let's look at the B part of verse 5. It goes on to say, how great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. Some translations say by such a spark. Now, without a spark, you can't start a fire. Not one bit. A small spark can start a fire which can cause a raging, destructive fire. My husband used to barbecue all the time. My cousin, her, her uh, husband, they used to barbecue all the time. They'd get out there and put the little um, newspaper, roll it up, light it, you know, and get a little tiny fire. And then they'd start this big, huge flame. And the flame is fueled by the air. You know, the, the more you leave the pit up, the higher the fire gets. Y'all know. And then, so you have to close it and cut off some of the oxygen so you could tame the fire down. Why? Because if the fire's too high or too hot, it'll destroy and burn up your meat. And sometimes when, when they would be having their little joy juice, our meat got burned up. <laughs> Ain't that right? <laughs> Amen. Uh, but... <laughs> Okay, y'all, that was back in the day. Sorry. I, don't tell Deacon. Don't tell Deacon. <laughs> but it was the truth. <laughs> but, but a fire can easily get out of control, right? Remember in 2018, the campfire in California? We saw all those scenes on TV. It was so heartbreaking and scary watching people drive through the flames, losing their homes. And there were 85 people that that died, 19,000 homes and businesses were destroyed, and the fire spread so rapidly that it took 17 days for them to get it at 100% containment. And it started by this, the electrical company's equipment. It was probably from a little small spark. And that raging fire was so destructive and for 17 days out of control. So James says this in verse 6. And the tongue is just like that. A fire. A world of unrighteousness. It sets 
the members, the rest of the members of the body. It stains the body. It sets your life on a course. Why? Because this fire is from the pits of hell. He says it right here. He said it's set on fire by hell. If what we say is not godly, it's from the pits of hell. Yeah, that's convicting, y'all. If what we're saying and how we're talking and our, our conversations and how we can snap off and, and I told them and, and rip people up with our tongues is from the very pits of hell. If it's not restrained, it affects our life and our lifestyles. Many sins, if not all sins, begin with the word. Yeah, that's interesting. A word, whether a word is spoken outwardly or, or, or inwardly, silently. Sometimes you could tell what somebody's thinking and, and want to say by their looks, right? And they're, right? <laughs> yeah, many sins begin. James said in verse 7, Every kind of beast and bird and reptile and sea creature can be tamed, and they have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue because it's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Back in Genesis chapter 1, we read about the creation and, and we know that our heavenly father, he spoke creation into existence. And so at that time, he went after he created the animals and mankind, he put mankind, he made mankind dominion over the animals, which is probably why James is saying they can be tamed and that they can be tamed by us because we have dominion over them but he doesn't mention the tongue because I believe also when you get to chapter 3 in Genesis this slimy slithery animal comes and approaches Eve with his tongue and he speaks a word of deceit and says to her did God really say and she fell for it and in walks sin the, taint, the tongue cannot be tamed because it was corrupted at the fall. It can't be tamed by us. But glory to God for divine intervention. Hallelujah. He goes on to say that it's a restless evil full of deadly poison. The tongue is restless. This restlessness is a characteristic of the demonic world and of evil. Remember in Job, when God was talking with the angels and Satan came up and God said, where have you come? And he said, I've been going to and fro, and up, and down, and all around, restless, seeking whom he may devour. The tongue is restless, a restless evil. So watch your mouth, because it's evil. I was thinking yesterday about, you know, just conversations, just talking, how quick and easy it is to just say something that's ungodly. When we were kids, some of you will remember, some of you young adults will remember, um, our parents did not allow us to say certain things. We couldn't tell each other to shut up, right? Right? We couldn't call each other liars. Yep. I think they knew something. We had to speak life into each other. We did. 
We couldn't, we couldn't even use the word but. I'm going to kick your butt. What? What did you say? No, you was about to get yours whooped, right, for saying that. And in our minds, we're like, there wasn't nothing bad, but I believe they knew something. Because the tongue, the root, the core of what we say that is wrong is from the pits of hell. Amen. And so our kids repeat what they hear when they're little. I was telling them, my son, he, he was very inquisitive. And one day he came up to me and, and he dropped the F-bomb. But he innocently asked me, what did it mean? What did it mean? And I'm laughing, but I was like in shock. But then I couldn't, I couldn't be mad at him or anything because guess where he heard it from? From my mouth, right? <laughs> from our mouths, from the pits of hell come words, phrases, hurt, insults. Amen. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's what we're taught to say when, we, when people talk about us. They, they said this. They said, they said I was, you know, the, color, the colorism is real when we were younger. They said, they said I was, I won't even say what they said because it was ugly, about the color of my skin. Sticks and stones will break, will, will, will uh, break your bones, but words will never hurt you. But, but I disagree. I disagree. I disagree because stick because the sticks and stones wounds heal, but then words wounds they're still sometimes hurting. We're still some of us are insecure and ashamed and afraid to do something because of what somebody said about us when we were kids. Amen. Watch your mouth. The tongue cannot be tamed by you, and it is evil. And now the last thing about it is by nature, it is inconsistent. Look at verse 9. James said, with it, with your tongue, with it, we bless our Lord and Father. And then with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. See, in James's day, the kings and the emperors would set up statues in the cities that they, that they reigned over. And if someone or anyone insulted or cursed the statue, they were treated as if they had cursed or insulted the emperor to his face. Because that statue was the image of the emperor or the king. Well, likewise, when we curse and insult the very people that are made in the image of God, which is you and I and everybody, then we are insulting. It is if we are insulting and cursing God himself. Brothers, that is that should not be so. We come here and lift our hands in the sanctuary. We lift our voices and praise him. We look up to heaven and give him all the glory and the honor. And then we look to our neighbor and we insult and curse and talk about him. <laughs> should not be so. And we're the worst. We're the worst Christians. Ugh. You hear so many stories. I used to know this guy, this uh, young man in my Sunday school class, and he worked at Church's Chicken over there on uh, Colorado Boulevard, I believe. He said he hated Sundays because the church people would come to church, but come there and buy the chicken, and they were rude. With the same mouth, <laughs> we'll bless and curse yeah, it's contradictory for those two things that come out of the mouth. It's hypocritical. It's hypocritical. 
They should be able to hear our conversations and know that we are Christians by our words. You see, just like the bit and the rudder can lead the whole horse and the whole ship, our tongue, we can be directed, our life can be directed and guided by our tongue. And if it's evil, then guess what? James said it kind of like this. He said, does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? No. Can a fig tree bear olives? No. Can a grapevine produce figs? No. Because, see, nature does what it's been created to do. Right? Nature produces its own kind. An apple tree is going to produce an apple. That's what it's created to do. It's going to produce after its own kind. So, brothers and sisters, if cursing and insults and all is coming out of our mouth, and then we're praising God over here, what are we producing? What is our nature? Are the praises just a cover-up? Is it hip are we being hypocritical? Yeah, 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 we come. We talk about the preacher, we talk about the church. We talk about our mamas, our daddies, our sisters, our brothers, our bosses, our teachers, our friends, our husbands, our wives. We run them down, we gossip. And then we lift our hands up to God and we praise and worship him. And we cry out to him with the same mouth. It ought not be so. So with our mouths, we, we have to watch our tongues because it's, they're powerful and evil and, and inconsistent. But guess what? There is good news. There is good news. The good news is that if we go to verse 2, we can see a little bit what James was saying, that, that believers are to mature. That's how we watch our mouths. We are to mature. Let's look at verse 2. He said, if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If anyone, in other words, that word for stumble is sin or, 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 you know, live in sin. In what he says, he is a perfect man or, in other words, a mature man. And he's able to bridle his whole body or, in other words, direct his life. As the young people would say, we need to level up. Come on, worship team. We need to level up. We need to mature. That's how we overcome our tongue. That's how we learn to watch our mouths by maturing. If we're able to, to walk this walk and allow God, anyone that allows God to take control, to steer, to guide, to, to transfer over, to direct, to guide this little tongue, if anyone allows that to happen, then he is mature and he's able to direct the course of his life. And the world will be able to see your words as works and know that you are Christian and I am Christian by our words. Sometimes when I'm having conversation with different people. I, I may have a little accent on some of my words. I, I'm really not even sure. And they'll say, where are you from? Because I, I hear a little accent. And, you know, I grew up in Colorado. But my parents are from Texas. And I lived in Texas for a little bit. So perhaps that's what you hear. 
But I tell you, last night after I was go reviewing my lesson, I said, I'm going to change what I say. The next time they ask me, do I have, where am I from? Where, where is that sound in your voice coming from? I'm going to let them know I got a divine accent. And that sound you hear, that voice that's coming out of my mouth is from my Father who art in heaven. It's from my deliverer. It's from my guide, my pilot, the one that directs and steers and, and turns. I'm submitting my tongue over to him. And that accent is divine. It's a divine accent. Amen. Amen. It's a tough word. It's a tough word that we can repent and ask for forgiveness over. And it's a tough word, but we can submit all that we are unto God. Because these, we've been, li obviously we know we've been living in the last days and times since Jesus ascended unto heaven. But boy, it sure is ramping up and he's getting closer and closer. Okay, and the world needs to see Jesus in us. Yeah, he, they need to see our faith at work. And some of it has to do with our conversations, what we say and how we talk. I was sharing with first service, I, I'm a caregiver for my dad. He has Alzheimer's and and he's uh, beginning to decline a, a lot more rapidly lately. And through over these last three years, my brother and sister and I, we have battled with each other. We have said ugly things to one another that cut deep, that hurt painfully. We have done things and said things and not got along, and therefore we haven't been given our father the best care he could have. And then when, uh, when everybody else sees how we're acting, I, I don't know if they see Pastor Karen always. All right? So recently, I don't know, the Lord has just been moving amongst the three of us like a lot. And my brother said to me one day, he's like, Karen, I feel God moving and changing me. And honestly, I was, start, I was seeing it. I mean, it wasn't just him. It was the three of us as we interacted with each other. And I tell you, he'd, he'd done some horrible, untrustworthy things. And so as I began to observe him, it was like the Spirit was letting me know that I need to trust him. So rather than me just trusting him, I told him with my mouth, the same mouth that had previously said mean and horrible things to him, I told him that I trusted him. And I surrendered, which I know the people that know the story are probably surprised, I surrendered all my dad's care unto him. Finances and all. And man, if you could have seen what that did to him, it uplifted him. It encouraged him. And we get along so well. We, we call each other all the time, laughing, talking. Because our words can matter and make a difference. And when we submit it unto the Holy Spirit, imagine if you go home today and apologize for what you said to spouse or to the child. Imagine if you go to work and somebody says something awful and you just say something nice in return. Imagine if we can uplift and encourage others with our tongue and our mouth. Imagine what the world would see. They would see Jesus. They would see our deeds. And so I'm just going to ask everyone to stand up as Pastor Kay comes. And as we watch our mouths, let's watch it shift.
Let's watch it change. Let's watch what we say. And I believe the word says we can take thoughts captive. So before it even comes out, let's begin to be aware of, of what we're thinking and grab it and take it captive and line it up to the word of God. <laughs>